I think it's time to start. Welcome to the uh, Hackpa All Stars track. Um, glad to see you all here and glad to see that the whole thing is possible that we can be at this conference and have a conference inside a conference. And as you can see, uh, we're pretty focused on a certain thing that is having some drinks in between. Um, if anyone is interested, just arrange it with the hosts of this event over here. Um, my first word is going out to Jonas to express my gratitude for his talk. It was a very early talk and he was challenged by the fact that his stupid hardware wasn't working, which was a challenge and thanks for keeping the nerves and standing here. And now it's my turn. Um, I shouldn't be here, but I am here. The problem is that we originally wanted to have Roman Chafigalin from uh, San Francisco, Russia here, but he couldn't come, there was visa problems, and uh, he just in the end didn't make it. So I'm, there, I'm just the backup, and I hope that is fairly okay. I'm going to present my talk about copy and paste. Uh, who has seen, has anyone seen the, the talk already or read the slides already? Because I think they're published. You have seen the talk already, yeah. In-house, in a corporation. So, copy and paste. Um, first, some word about myself. My name is Mario. I have a small company. We do pen tests. We don't do APT or single slide. We just do pen tests and security. And we hope we do this quite well. Um, I've written some papers, written some books, given some talks, uh, maintained some projects out there, HTML5 security cheat sheet, and don't purify. And basically, I like everything that is within lesser than and greater than, which is a pretty huge scope. Um, I do tweet, but mostly useless stuff. And if you have any questions that you want to ask me, after the talk, you can just like write me an email and then I will most likely even respond. So, um, what this talk is going to introduce is, in my opinion, like a fairly novel attack vector because I haven't seen anything like this ever before. But it is an attack vector that, in fact, requires user interaction. So, to unfold the attack, to execute it, you have to do something. So, you have to get the victim to do something. Um, which is not so bad because I think it's like plausible user interaction. So it's not like burning hoops that you have to jump through and then this and this happens and you have to stomp your foot. But it's something that users would actually do and do in fact. So I know people who do exactly that thing that is required to carry out the attack. And the good thing, of course, every good bug has a logo and here's ours. That was created by, where is he? Where is, where is Ange? There he is, by Ange Albertini. Thank you very much. And this logo perfectly expresses what this whole thing is about because we copy something and then insects come out of a machine. Uh, well, not exactly, but close. So to kind of show you what the whole thing is about and what the attack means, um, I decided to kind of put the juicy part in the very beginning of the talk and first demonstrate the attack and then explain how the whole thing happened. So let's do this now. Um, let's take the following story. We have like a user and his name is Mr. Derp and he wants to write a mail to Derpina and uh, he does so by opening Gmail, which is a commonly used webmailer, maybe you know it or not, and uh, you would click the Compose button. And then this thing opens, and you would write, like, hello, Derpina, how are you? And then you would write something here, how are you, Justin Bieber, or something like this. Anyway, and then he wants to kind of write something in here, and then remembers, oh man, I have this kind of document, and I wanted to copy something from this document into the email. So let me just do this real quick. The document is right here, and we open it. Oh, that was kind of not the best thing to do right now. Just one second. Sorry. We open the document and we write, hello, Derpina. And then we're like, okay, that's done. That's exactly what I wanted to write, what I wanted to kind of copy and paste into the mail. So we copy it, control A, control C. And then we go back to Gmail, to the compose window, and we throw it in here. And like, huh, what's going on? Oops, that's strange. So, hmm, where, where is that coming from? There's like JavaScript in my Gmail right now, and it's doing stuff, it's learning stuff. That's Usually not a good sign if something like this happens. <laughs> and I say like, okay, that's probably this kind of kind of edge browser, like this niche case browser, like Firefox, who uses this still anyway. This would never happen in Chrome or any other browser, right? Like, it's got to be a browser bug or something like this. So we open Chrome with the same thing here. We're just like, all right, let's put this in here. And oops, also works in Chrome. That sucks. So there's got to be something too. There's going to be something more generic. Now the question is, what is this thing? How did it happen? And how can we do this? And how can we kind of get to the point of understanding what it does? And uh, how can we extend this and make like a real attack out of this? Um, it's actually quite interesting because we're doing something here by copying from one application that has nothing to do with the browser some content and paste it into the browser. And then all of a sudden we have JavaScript. It's like, why would that kind of like, this, this is not supposed to work because OpenOffice where we copied from doesn't speak HTML. It speaks some kind of weird XML dialects and doc and docx and all those file formats, but not HTML. I mean, sure, somewhere under the core it also speaks HTML, but not when you have opened a document. That is strange. 
So we want to know what's going on here, and we want to find out how we can actually debug this kind of thing, and uh, what else we can do with this kind of attack. Um, as you could see, like I mentioned, we copy something from an open office document. And then we paste this whole thing into an editable area in a browser, like for example, the email compose window in Gmail, or Outlook, or Yandex, or Yahoo Mail, whatever. It doesn't really matter which kind of tool it is. It applies to all mailers out there that have a rich text editor. Actually, it applies to everything that has a rich text editor. I think a lot of things have rich text editors. And we want to know where is this kind of strange HTML coming from that is causing the JavaScript execution, because there must be some kind of origin. What creates this? Um, to do so, we have to go back in time a little bit and learn about a certain thing. And the certain thing was back then called <coughs> cut and paste. Cut and paste is an operation that had its origins actually in the medieval ages when people were first starting to write books. And then they put those books into a very moist cellar and then the book started to mold and then they realized, oh, the book is breaking so we need to kind of rescue parts of the book and put it into a new book. So they used a scissor or a razor blade, cut some parts from that old rotting book and put it in a new book. Cut and paste. That's when it started. And cutting and pasting is still being used by editors today. So for example, if you have like film tape or something like this, then you use special scissors and you cut and then you paste, which is quite interesting. And we do the same thing in the age of computers. This is Apple's Lisa, one of the first actual usable computers for uh, personal use. And Apple's Lisa was the first machine that instrumented this very thing, cut and paste, and also copy and paste, and called it, or called the medium where the data that is being stored for this kind of uh, temporary storage, the clipboard. So you cut something, it goes into this temporary storage, which we call the clipboard, and then you paste it somewhere. Maybe it's still in the clipboard, or it's not in the clipboard anymore, and so on. So you can just like cut something, you can paste something, you can copy something, you can paste something that will duplicate things. And there was the first machine that actually gave it a name and said, that's the clipboard, where we store this data. Now the origins of the clipboard are pretty old, actually. I think the first mentioning of the clipboard being something complex and being capable of storing complex data was coming from a white paper from IBM. And they described this and they published the paper and everybody could use it. And then some years later, Microsoft put a patent on it and released the whole feature in Windows 3.1. So Windows 3.1, um, which I'm of course still using, is uh, the first operating system that we know that uses a complex clipboard that is capable of storing various objects inside the clipboard. So usually you copy some text and then you only have this piece of text in the clipboard. But with Windows 3.1, it was the first time that several buckets were present in the clipboard. One text bucket, one un Unicode text bucket, one uh, localized text bucket, and so on. So they made it like an object and a complex store where you can just like put various things into. So let's stick with this clipboard thing. The clipboard today is used in many, many, many different scenarios. Of course, quite obviously, copy and paste. Cut and paste, but also if you drag and drop, then the data that is being used for dropping after dragging is also stored in the clipboard. And there's even APIs uh, that are specified by, uh, what w uh, but by uh, W3C, sorry, that say um, how the clipboard should be treated by browsers, what kind of security implications exist, what can go wrong, what can go right, and how browsers should implement this thing. So clipboard is pretty common. And I think even on mobile devices, you can use the clipboard and you know, copy stuff and paste stuff somewhere else. It's just a bit harder to do this with your fingers. Anyhow, the clipboard is something that is being used a lot today. So who here uses the clipboard on a daily basis? I mean, I do, obviously, like everybody does, I think, except for you, right? Um, good man. <laughs> so as you can see, the clipboard is something that we use all the time. And one of the magic properties of the clipboard is that we have no fucking clue what is in there. We have no idea. It's like completely transparent. We never check what's in there. I know that there are some people who are certain, applied with a certain amount of paranoia. It's like, yeah, before I paste something after I copied it, I always put it into the editor to see if it really is what it is. So yeah, you waste a lot of time. You can do other things, but that's very paranoid. But maybe it's even healthy, because then this kind of particular attack would not work. Anyhow, everybody uses the clipboard, some more paranoidly, others not. But the majority of people, including myself, has no idea what's going on in the clipboard. We just hope that everything is fine in there and that will result in what we actually expect. So what I was going to do is, how does, why is Justin Bieber in my slides? I think Justin Bieber kind of made it into my slides. Um, if you find occasions of Justin Bieber, you're supposed to call Bieber very, very loudly. The first one to call Bieber. Bieber! Good one. You deserve a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how it works. So if you're thirsty, and if you spot a Bieber, and if you're the first one to scream Bieber, you will get a drink. You can even choose which drink. Is that cool? Is that a good deal? I mean, it's 11 o'clock, right? So 
anyhow, I was, I was thinking about how can we get to the point of losing this aspect of transparency, of, of not being able to kind of guess what is happening in the clipboard and getting more lever on understanding the clipboard and understanding the complexity. And I was looking for a while and trying to find out if there's any tools that give me like access to the raw clipboard. And I was searching for quite some time and uh, ultimately I found a tool, a very simple one too, from Peter Büttner, I think it's a German dude, and it was written in, maybe he's here, is he here Peter, are you here? No. And it was written in July 2003. And it doesn't do much except for opening and then giving me insight into what is going on in the clipboard. And it's very, very interesting because it showed me that there is indeed a bunch of complex buckets in my clipboard when I copy something, even if I copy very simple information. Um, if you want to do this thing on Linux, I didn't find anything that is working well on Linux, but uh, someone uh, told me it was Dave. He told me that the whole thing, like this clip view tool from Peter, is also running with Wine and uh, gives you the same information so you can debug this as well, which is quite nice. Anyhow, imagine you have a very simple file, like a text file. And you open this text file, you type some stuff in there, and then you copy that stuff. And then you have a look at the clipboard with clip view. And then you realize that there is not just like one string of text in there. No, there is indeed four buckets. We have one bucket that says CF underscore Unicode text. Beba in your clipboard. That's a drink in your mouth. <laughs> We have a CF underscore locale, we have a CF underscore text, and we have a CF underscore OEM text. So there's four buckets for the simple piece of text that has no layouting, no formatting, no nothing. So we need four buckets for that, some for the locales, where there's nothing in there, the OEM text, the text, and the Unicode text. That's interesting. So if you copy something from somewhere else, maybe there's even more buckets and even more interesting stuff if a simple text file already gives us four buckets. So here I opened uh, Word 365. And uh, I created some text very cautiously, and I formatted it and gave it some colors and some backgrounds and some underlines and whatnot, because I wanted to create some layout for this whole thing to see if this somehow reflects in the clipboard. And then I opened Clip View again and clicked on View, and it showed me that there's like a huge amount of buckets in there. All right. We have a data object, an object descriptor, we have rich text format. Who loves rich text format? That's like one of, the best, one of the best markup languages ever. We have HTML, which is quite interesting. We have CF text again, Unicode text, and has Metafile, Metafile picked, embed source, native on a link, link source, and so on. A bunch of objects in there that are all just caused by copying this thing. I think it's like 13 different buckets with 13 different things in there. And you can see already, you can guess already what this is here because this looks like HTML. And now it gets sexy and kind of gives us the first explanation of what is actually going on here, why we have an XSS in Gmail by copying something from an open office file. Um, to whoever loves HTML as like a clean and you know, well-specified and compact language, you will probably hate this. This is the interpretation of HTML as Microsoft sees it, because this is like HTML that is being generated by Office. So Office, upon copying something or having the user copy something, will create these buckets in the clipboard, and one of these buckets is HTML, and of course, Office generates this HTML. We can see already that it's coming from Office because it has like things like P class MSO normal, and MSO BD font for big directional fonts and stuff like this, MSO highlight yellow, so all this kind of weird, non-existing Office-only CSS stuff that is in here, and other units and other colors that you would only expect from an Office software to be generated into HTML. So it's kind of ugly. But that doesn't, that doesn't worry us because we also see that a bunch of things that we manually created, for example, the term Justin, are reflecting, are corresponding. And uh, that is good. So we can maybe go further and have even more correspondence in there by manipulating the document. Let's see if this can be done. What we've seen so far for a quick recapitulation is that the clipboard is indeed fairly complex. So we copy something that is fairly complex, has layout information, and the clipboard is blown up to have containing like 13 buckets of complex information with null bytes and localized information, Unicode information, and HTML information, and rich text format, and whatnot. And that the whole process of copy and pasting is apparently done in a way that the application where you copy from creates those buckets. Then they are there. And then the application where you paste into says like, hmm, let me have a look at those buckets. Oh, this one looks good. I'll take this. So there's a kind of a, a negotiation process going on between the copy application and the pasting application. So the pasting application just grabs what it likes most from the application that copied into the clipboard, which is quite nice. So we have a certain amount of control over that. Now the question is, how can we turn this whole thing rogue? Um, here, for example, we see what happens if we copy a file. 
we see there's again a data object, idealist array, data object, a bunch of references and whatnot. So depending on what you copy, different things will be created. If you go to Photoshop, for example, open Photoshop and copy some layers there, you can guess that there's like 20, 30 buckets. If you go to like a waveform editor or some audio tool and copy the audio in there, you will again find completely different buckets. If you copy that into the browser, the browser says, like, uh, I'm checking those buckets, but I cannot find anything that is useful for me. So I don't know, just give me text or what. So it always depends on what the application puts in there and what the other application grabs from there. Now, let's talk about security, because that's kind of why we're here. Um, I think that clipboard attacks are interesting, but they have been around for quite some time. I still remember when there was like some Linux forums. And people were asking, like, how can I run my Ubuntu with two displays? And some dude was answering, uh, so like, yeah, you just have to do this and this and that. Just copy this code, execute it as root, and you'll be fine. And there was, of course, benign code that looks like it would be making sense. But there was also code that was just formatted in font size zero. So you wouldn't see it, but it was still in the clipboard. You would paste it in the console, and then you pound. Um, that was actually quite common. We did this on Slackers all the time back then. Uh, I did this on Slackers all the time back then. Anyone? <laughs> still this? Oh, all right. So um, now the question is, can we do this in a bit more advanced way? We, we have already seen that it's possible, but we want to know how. And how can we do this? How can we modify the document that is completely unrelated to produce HTML that is actually dangerous? Let's have a look and start with the simple case. This is, again, OpenOffice or LibreOffice or whatever, something star office ish And we, again, cheer to our master, Justin Bieber, say, oh, God, Justin, follow me on Twitter. And we lay out this nicely, and we give it nice colors and backgrounds and whatnot. And then we copy this thing. And I created a small application to kind of be closer to the browser and not always rely on the clip view thing as uh, an intermediate tool. And I pasted this into the browser and then, again, analyzed the HTML that is resulting. Because the good thing is if you copy from Office and you paste into the browser, then the layout is being preserved and it's still there. And the question is like, where is it coming from? We learned this a bit already. There's HTML that is being produced. And now let's have a look. This is the HTML that is being produced by LibreOffice. It's not much better than the HTML that Microsoft Office produces, so it's just Office HTML. Like Nobody likes this. It's just disgusting. But we see something interesting in here. We see that there is a style element and the style element ends. And inside the style element, we have strings. And strings are cool, right? Like when we see strings, you know that there's going to be parsing, and strings are being made to break, break out uh, breaking out from. And uh, we want to know, we want to know, we want to find out if this is actually possible. So the strings are the font names: Liberation Saw, Wen Kuan Yi Micro High, and Lohit Hindi. If you're like in the uh, European American area, you will get the default font Liberation Saw. If you're in the Asian area, you will get Wen Kuan Yi Micro High. And if you're in the Indian area and so on, you will get Lohit Hindi. So the, the, the software decides based on your computer locale which language to actually show. So just in case, all those three languages for those three fonts are in here which is quite nice. Now, the thing we have to do is we have to ask ourselves, does it correspond with something that we can control in that document? And how can we find this out? Well, it's quite easy. We all know that OpenOffice documents are essentially zip files. So we just go to the folder, and uh, we grab that file, and we rename it to zip. And it's, of course, a valid zip. And inside the zip, we can do stuff. We can just have a look at the contents and find out what is in there. And one of those files is called styles.xml. And we just saw that we have a style element in the H in generated HTML. And then there's a style element. We have strings that mark the font names. So it is quite of, kind, of, kind, of, kind of intuitive to have a look at styles.xml if those font names are also present in this particular file. And indeed, they are. So if you open this thing, we can see that there is indeed when you micro high and some other ones of those strings that we saw earlier. And the first intuition here would, of course, be let's mess with those strings. Let's kind of try to break those strings, or maybe even go further and try to break the entire style element and inject new HTML. So my first attempt at this was to go into this file, modify it, use entities, because otherwise I would invalidate the XML, close the style element without even closing the string, who cares about the string, and then inject new HTML, which is just a strike through tag, as simple as possible. Then I saved this thing updated the archive, saved the archive, renamed it back to ODT, opened the whole thing in OpenOffice, copied the whole thing, went to the browser, pasted the whole thing, and boom, there was a strike through tag in my browser. And it's a strike through tag that I created inside that font name. So I'm indeed breaking stuff and can inject font names, and they can break the style element, and they can then inject arbitrary HTML. So that's cool. That's easy. Research done. And the only thing I have to do right now is just like put an iframe in or an embed all, uh, element or an object or a script tag and then do bad stuff. Well, that wasn't true. 
because browsers know about this. Browsers are not stupid. Browsers have a sanitizer, and the sanitizer is installed in all browsers. Each and every one works differently, but it's present in all browsers, and it sanitizes the clipboard. So whenever something is being copied and pasted from one domain to another domain, so across domain borders, it first goes through the sanitizer. And the sanitizer fixes it and says, like, yeah, script goes out, iframe goes out, object goes out, embed goes out. This all has to go away. Event handlers go out, JavaScript URIs go out, input type password goes out, comments go out. Let's just make sure that the clipboard is safe. It's like, oh, OK, this is kind of a challenge. There is a sanitizer, and it's in the browser, and it keeps me from doing bad stuff. I cannot tolerate this. So I had a look at the sanitizer. And uh, I was thinking, OK, what can we do? Can we break the sanitizer? Is this possible to kind of find out what it does, how it works, and uh, is there any weaknesses? And I mean, you know sanitizers, right? Like, of course, there's a weakness. And uh, this is a bypass. So what we can see here is a closing style element. Then we open, guess what, an SVG element. Because SVG is, as mentioned, a gift that always keeps on giving. And then inside this SVG, we have another style element. And then we style the SVG to be positioned in a fixed way. We start a new style element. We have to do this because the parser is weird and we cannot have semicolon in there. Like semicolon is a forbidden character. I have no idea why yet. Um, we have another style element where we say, okay, top zero, left zero, very high, very wide, and it should be transparent. So this is basically just taking care that the entire thing that we intend to produce overlaps everything in the application where we paste into. And now comes the magic. We're still inside the SVG and we create a link or an anchor. And this link, of course, needs to be namespaced. So we put it into the xlink namespace, and we assign it an href, like a location where it point to in the href is question mark. So something that an XSS sanitizer would not really see as malicious. This XSS tool would say, look, or the sanitizer would say, look, oh, that's cool, link, href, question mark, that's cool. Then we create a huge circle. We make, we make sure that the circle is also huge, has like 4,000 units of whatever, and overlaps everything again, just in case. Then we close the circle, and then next to the circle, we have an animate element. And animate elements are so great. And there's like this funny story. When they created SVG, they basically took PGML from Adobe, Precision Graphics Markup Language, and VML from Microsoft. And they said, like, we need to unite those two standards and uh, take the best out of those things. And the majority of SVG is actually PGML. And just like one tiny bit of SVG is actually coming from VML. And it's just like the shitty bit. That's animations and set text. And ironically, those two things from Microsoft that made it into SVG are not supported by Microsoft Internet Explorer. And I think they know why, because it's like so bad. Anyhow, one of those things is the animate element. And with the animate element, we can declaratively influence the content of other surrounding elements. And we can, for example, say, hey, um, I am now the child of this link. So the link is my parent element, and I will always influence my parent element unless told otherwise. And I want to influence the attribute angslink href. Now you might scratch your head and say, like, why do links have to be animatable? Like colors I can see, that positions I can see, the dimensions I can see, but links, really? Who you? What, what kind of use case is that? Doesn't matter, links are animatable. You can animate them. Then we say the animation should start at second zero, so right away, and we animate from a JavaScript URI to ampersand. And now this is where the magic happens, because animating something to ampersand can't be done in XML because ampersand in XML is illegal. So the browser starts to do the animation. It says, look, I'm taking this from the JavaScript URI to the ampersand. Then it realizes, oh, I can't do this because ampersand is illegal. Let me just jump back to the old value. And it jumps to from, and thereby we inject the JavaScript URI without the browser sanitizer noticing. It's actually that simple. So to be able to kind of use this in the XML context and not mess up the parser and create something that is not well formed, we of course have to entity encode it. And uh, the final exploit looks like this. We have office font face declaration style font face style name, and then here is our vector. That is the whole thing, just entity encoded, and that's it. Now, when we save the document and rename it back to ODT and then open it and then copy something from it and then paste it into Gmail, then it looks like this. This is actual Gmail source code. Um, I think the Google people here can confirm this. And uh, here's our stuff. We have a diff, content editable false. We have an SVG. We have the style elements. We have the A. We have a circle. We have the animate. And then it's doing its thing. And interestingly, this trick bypasses both Firefox's sanitizer and Chrome sanitizer. I have not yet understood why. And I, I think that the Firefox people are working on a fix. Not sure about the Chrome people, um, but you can ask them here. So it's strange that the same bypass is affecting two different processes. Of course, it doesn't work on IE because, like I said, IE doesn't even support animations, and they know why. Anyhow, so to get through this whole thing, who's it, people? 
You said people. Someone said people. No one said people. Okay, no booze then. Um, to go through this whole thing step by step, <laughs> yeah, just like very easy. Um, the first thing we create an open office document, then we rename it from ODG to zip, then we uh, open the styles XML in here, then we find the string micro high, because that's like one of the subtle parts. We're in the uh, uh, Western Europe hemisphere, so we will never be shown the micro high thing because we would only be shown that with the Chinese locale. So it is present but invisible to us because we always see just the European stuff. Then we change this thing, um, we had HTML encode the bypass, we put it back into the file, we save it. Um, we close the file, we open it in open office again, we copy, we paste, and then we have an attack on Firefox and Chrome, which is quite nice. And I think like, okay, yeah, open office, Firefox and Chrome, that's not that much surface there. We, we can do better. And I had to look at PDF. And as we all know, PDF files are not zip files. Um, they are different. And uh, so you better open them with a hex editor or nothing else. And as you can see already, here we have Adobe's Reader in the latest version, and we have IE in the latest version, and again, Gmail. And apparently, something says alert. So I had a look at the PDF and the hex editor and uh, was kind of stuck with this thing with the font names. So like, why not look for the section where they define the font names? And indeed, there is a section inside the PDF where they do define the font names, and it's right here. But I learned two things that are limitations. One limitation, my attack can only have 32 characters because a font name cannot have more characters than PDFs. And second limitation is that I cannot use any parentheses and I can use, cannot use any ampersand. I was like, ah, eh, no parentheses, no ampersand. That's bad. I kind of have to work around that. And luckily, my good friend Visual Basic Script came for a rescue. Sorry for that. And uh, enabled me to execute arbitrary code without using parentheses. And IE, as we all know, still supports VBS, even Spartan. And uh, so we can do it like this. We go ahead, we inject a double quote, language equals VBS. So we jump into VBS mode. Then we just simply say on click alert plus one because that also works. You don't need the parentheses in VBS anymore, which is nice. And the effect, yes. Uh, you can also do spaces, but I think not in attributes, only in actual uh, script elements. There's some kind of, kind of changes depending on which, which context you're executing. So when you copy this into Gmail and have a look at the result in the editor, we see this font element being created. And uh, here we see the event tenders, the language switch, and everything is there. I know you might say like, yeah, VBS, you know, you have to go like IE 10 document mode or something like this. Um, do not have to, because this thing is future-proof because in ECMAR script 6, we also don't need any parentheses, so we can use backticks to execute the whole thing, and the new IE versions already support this, so we just have to wait until the new IE versions are more penetrated in the market, and then we don't need VBS anymore. And uh, backticks are also accepted as font names in Adobe Reader and don't result in a broken file, which is good. So step by step again, we create a B9 PDF, we find the section of the font family names, we modify them very, very carefully with the hex editor. We learn some things, what is possible, what is not possible. Then we kind of change this accordingly, and uh, now we kind of realize something, and we realize that the Adobe Reader does not create an HTML bucket. So like, oh, we don't, we don't have what we need. We don't have any HTML. But it does create an RTF bucket, rich text format. And then we also learn that IE, upon not finding an HTML bucket, automatically fall back to the RTF bucket and interprets the RTF on its own and converts it into HTML and then puts it into the DOM. And that's our bypass here, because there's another conversion process happening from RTF to HTML or from HTML to the DOM. And we have another XSS, which is nice. And I was trying the same thing for uh, MS Office, of course. Like, my goal at some point was just like to stretch it out to all available Office softwares and all available browsers, and this worked. Just always in a slightly different way, but it worked. So I create open, I create an Office file, open it in Office again, and you can see again we have the alert, so apparently something is happening here, too many alerts during this day. And I open the same file with the hex editor, which was a doc file, not a docx file, um, which is kind of weirdly UTF-16 formatted, so we have this null bytes everywhere. And again, we find out that there's font names in there and that there's like link hrefs in there, so you can again modify this thing in a way to produce valid HTML that is capable of executing JavaScript from within the file that is being copied and then pasted into the browser, which is nice. Same thing happened with uh, docx. Docx is, uh, is uh, zip-based, so if you rename a docx file to, a zip, to be a zip file, then you can open it as a folder and can see the contents. Um, strangely, the relevant information in docx is not, as you might assume, in the styles XML, but actually in the document XML. So then again, we go here, we add a double quote here that is encoded, then we add a single quote because in the later following conversion process, those are being normalized. Then we add the almost over, say alert for, and then we're done. That's all we need. And the result, of course, is this. That's true, you deserve a drink. 
So we can see um, I had to test a little bit here and kind of fuzz a little bit here and find the right way and the right combination. And in the end, it was this one generating me almost over alert four. The other ones did not go so well, but main thing is we got through and we have another XSS. So step by step, we create a doc. We put a hyperlink into this doc. We open this with a hex editor or the uh, matching XML file. Um, we edit around a little bit. We make sure that we add one important thing, which is a diff that says content editable false, because if we have something clickable in an editable area, that click will never really happen. So if you have a link in an editable area and you click this link, there is no navigation. So we have to create an island that is non-editable inside this editable area, because then we can click this thing again. So it's like an editable area, which is the mail editor. And then in this editable area, we have a non-editable area that we flag with content editable false. And then in there, we can click links again. This is like one of these uh, XSS tricks that you can use when working against like live RTEs, just like always create islands that are not editable, then your attacks work again. So Word, friendly, again, creates an HTML bucket. We have seen this in the beginning already. I MSIE understands that upon pasting, and then we have another XSS. And it's pretty much the same procedure for doc and docx. They are pretty much identical, except for the content of the file, of course. And then there was like my favorite attack, um, because I was kind of running out of Office files and Office formats, and I was like, what else is there? We have PDF, doc, Excel, ODT. <laughs> What else is there? Oh, yes, there is the PDF killer that never worked, that kind of uh, retired at some point, and that's XPS. The possibility to print a document into a file that is self-containing. It contains all the fonts, embeds all the fonts, embeds all the information, and that has the file ending XPS. You can print to file in Windows, and then you get an XPS, and you can open this file with any other Windows. And I had a look at XPS and opened with the hex editor. I couldn't understand anything in there, which is like complete garbage. Then I read the specification, and there was like many hundred pages. I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Then I had a look at Wikipedia, and they said, like, yeah, they have like some kind of compression, but it's like proprietary compression, and you can maybe crack this. I said, like, no, I don't have time for this. So I thought, like, okay, if this is a file format that embeds, then I can create a font, and that font can be evil. And then I just use this font on the attacker's computer. And then I create something that is written and layouted with this font. Then I save this as an XPS. And then the evil font should be embedded, right? It should be all there. I don't need to break the compression scheme. I just take the font and just like put it in there. Maybe that works. And apparently it does. And if you have a look at the result, you see that it's like completely broken because it also pastes the meta information from the clipboard, like which version, where the HTML starts, where it ends, and so on. And then finally an iframe, which is like a good step ahead of what we had before, because that executes without user interaction. Now, how did I do this? Well, I used some open source font that I found somewhere on the internet. And then I used one of my favorite tools, which is FontForge, which is like one very powerful free and open source font editor. And I had a look at the font, and I tried to locate all those properties inside this font that could potentially reflect in the HTML that is being produced by copying from the XPS. And I found a bunch of things, and uh, most of the interesting things I found in the section on TTF names. And the TTF names contain several properties. And it turns out that weirdly, and I don't really know why, the English US string for preferred family is the string in the font that is being inside the XPS and makes it through the copy and paste process. Um, I identified them by just like saying 1112223 and checked which one actually arrived in the uh, pasted. And this was the one. So I went ahead and said, all right, let's break out anything that is here, create the content editable area that uh, says false. And then we create the iframe that is passing to a JavaScript URI, alerting document domain, and use this as the name for the font, or precisely as the preferred family name for that font. If you then install this font on the attacker system and have a look at that font, you will not see anything about this. Who said Bieber? Excellent. There's a drink for you. And uh, if you have a look at this font, install this font, you will never ever anywhere see this preferred font family name. So this is some kind of this internal properties. But strangely, it unfolds upon copy pasting. Try it out, it's very weird. Um, so we go again step by step. We take some free form from somewhere. We open it using FontForge. We modify the preferred family name. We put it to become some uh, HTML vector. We create a document. We export this document to XPS. We send it around. Someone copies, someone pastes. We have an XSS. That's pretty nice. That is actually one of the bugs that Microsoft fixed. So with the last Patch Tuesday, they fixed this one. At least, uh, yeah, somehow, sorta, not really. But yeah, parts of it are fixed. Um, we're in contact. Um, so these are the attacks. And to give you like a qu quick overview of, of what we've done so far, we have learned that we can copy in a PDF and paste into the browser, and we have an XSS. We can copy from a doc or a docx and paste into the browser. We have an XSS, XPS to the browser, XSS, ODT to the browser, XSS, and essentially most of the Office software that is out there. 
So if anybody ever sends you like an office file and say like, yeah, can you just like copy paste this thing and put it here? Be careful because there could be something in there. And those attacks can technically slumber in that inside these documents for ages because like who would ever notice that something like this is possible? Affected software right now is Office 2013, Office 365, LibreOffice, similar tools, PDF reader, I even tested Foxit reader and it's affected as well. And affected browsers is just MSIE, Chrome, Opera, Safari, Firefox, anything on WebKit, anything on Blink. Um, there were some slight differences between the behavior on Blink on Windows and Blink on Linux and Blink on OS X. Um, I did not really understand why that is because I just had a week for this research. And uh, it works on both operating systems, but slightly differently. So we basically have full coverage of all Office software and all browsers, just always with slight, slightly different vectors. We can easily just put them all in one doc, of course. And uh, there's other stuff that we can do as well, which is quite funny. So I didn't kind of want to limit it to just like browser only. So I always was thinking, also was thinking like, what happens if you take something from the browser and put it into another application? So for example, if you copy a data table from a website or a text file and then throw it into Excel, it's quite funny because in Excel you have like this kind of web service function and a web service function is capable of just like polling a service and then returning uh, the size of the response. So I was like, hmm, okay, that is interesting. If you put this into an Excel file and then open the Excel file, then Excel will say, oh, this is like security stuff. You shouldn't, do you really want to do this? Because we're going to issue requests now. If you, however, paste it into Excel, the security is gone and it does not ask. So you paste something from a text file or a website into your Excel, and then you have a perfectly functioning intranet port scanner by just using a combination of web service and if and web service again, and eventually send out a request to your server that tells you, oh, this IP with this port is open, have fun scanning, which is quite nice. And I believe that there's more things like that. So the further you look and the more combinations you try, the more interesting things you can find because this whole thing is just so complex. And I think it's a huge playground. And the nastiest thing, of course, comes from one of my favorite companies. And they created this amazing software that we know as the Flash Player. Um, who uses the Flash Player? No one, wow. <laughs> It's very impressive. Um, so Flash has a clipboard API. And uh, Flash allows us to fill stuff into the clipboard. And Flash also allows us to define the kind of bucket that we want to fill the clipboard with. And Flash says, like, you have a text bucket that you can fill, you have an RTF bucket that you can fill, and you have an HTML bucket that you can fill, and some custom buckets, but they're useless. And that's cool. But sadly, we require a click for that. I'm like, okay, in Flash you can do it, but Flash is already running into the browser inside the browser and we require a quick, so it's not really like a big enhancement of the attack surface, but wait a second, you can embed Flash files in PDFs, and if you open them with Adobe Reader, well, then they also execute. So I created a Flash file that is actually doing this, kind of waiting for the click, then filling the clipboard, and then I embedded this into a PDF and made sure that the whole thing is like covering the entire PDF, and when you select something in the PDF, then the Flash file pushes forward, registers the click, fills the clipboard, um, does this with a certain delay, waits until you're done with the actual copy pasting, and then replaces the content of the actual clipboard with its own clipboard, so that means you can have a rogue PDF that is using Flash to fill your clipboard with other stuff, and once you copy and you paste from this PDF, you get something completely different in return. I think it's like a revolution in academia because you cannot plagiarize anymore because you have like HTTP based detection of plagiarism inside your PDFs, inside your papers. But uh, yeah, no one kind of picked up on that and I think my billion dollar idea went to the crapper. Anyhow, this works and this is quite fine. Now the question is what can we do in terms of defense? Um, because this sucks a little bit and it's not really helpful if we kind of, kind of straight this idea that copy and paste all of a sudden is not very dangerous and there's no defense. I think the best defense is just to use control shift V and not to use control V. Because if you use control V to paste, you paste with layout. If you use control shift V and you paste, you just use the text. It's only the Unicode text bucket or the actual text bucket that is being pasted and not any of the other things. At least that should be the case for most software. Um, I also tried to create a browser extension that is running in Chrome, but my coding skills are so bad that it works at home, but never at conferences. So I'm not going to demo this because it's not going to work. My kind of attempt was to, to go ahead and overwrite paste events globally on the whole page for every element and uh, then use a small trick because um, I was using like a slightly tweaked version of the clipboard API that is also capable of extracting the text HTML information that is in the clipboard. And before actually pasting it into something on that page, I paste it into a text area, and this text area is of course safe, and it takes the content from the text area, I change it through our XSS filter through DOM Purify, and then I bring it back to the clipboard, and then it's actually pasted. But this sounds so adventurous that you can already guess that it doesn't work, um, because 
I think it's a race condition, and I keep losing this race, at least on conferences. No, never at home, because I don't know why. But don't use this tool. There is a GitHub repo for this, but don't use it. Um, it's just a kind of basic idea of how you could make defense. Um, maybe someone can pick it up and make something better out of this. Um, I think there's a lot of future work that we can have a look at, because as mentioned, I just had a look at a very small slice. I had a look at what happens when you copy something from an Office document into the browser. And we got to the point of having XSS. We also got to the point of having like a username disclosure because there's the local paths in there, so I know what's your username then, and other things. And I had like a very, very brief look at what's happening when you copy from the browser into Office software um, that obviously disables, uh, disables some, of some of the security controls and allows you to do things that you otherwise cannot do without a prompt. But I believe that there is much more surface and much more things that we can have a look at. So. I guess this might be interesting, and uh, you're very welcome to have a look at these things and find new bugs in new software, maybe find crashes, maybe find the possibility to re-enable macros uh, without actually enabling them, or something like this. I'm pretty sure if you try hard, then you get, get, can get to a point of turning copy-paste into real-life code execution. So let's see. Um, I think we have arrived at the point of where I can say we have a conclusion. Just in general, be careful when you copy and paste. Don't trust this kind of invisible thing that is the clipboard where we have no idea what's going on in there. Respect the fact that it's like a very complex object storage that gives you certain things and can do certain things. And keep poking at this because I think there's a lot of bugs in there, maybe even bounties, and it's at least interesting. So let's see. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. I hope there's questions or comments. And uh, if you want to play with those files that I was only showing on screenshots, you just click this link that you cannot see because it's <laughs> invisible. <laughs> Uh, but you will find the presentation on SlideShare. Just go to my SlideShare account, SlideShare slash x00mario, and there is the presentation and the link. So you can click this link, and then you will get redirected to GitHub, and all the files are there. The PDFs are there, the doc files are there, the uh, flash file is there, everything is there. You can play with it and test it. And let me know what you think. That's all I got. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? There is a question. Yes, there is ways of doing that, and some RegEx editors do this by overriding the default copy-paste behavior. Um, I, of course, had a look at RegEx editors do, during, this, during this research phase. Um, I would say it's like an 80-20 ratio. 80% 80 are vulnerable, 20% protect against this. Not sure if they know why and how, but they kind of have their own sanitization processes. So CK editor, one of the editors that we covered during the training uh, in the past two days, already protects against this um, because they seem to be pretty fast forward in terms of security. Others do not. And it depends. If you use it in Gmail, it works. If you use it in Google Docs, it doesn't work. If you use it in Outlook, it works. If you use it in uh, Office 365 Web, it doesn't work. So there is ways to protect against, protect against this. And this is essentially by overriding the paste behavior of the editable area. And it's not so hard. And with the new clipboard API, you can do it. Um, I think they use their own custom filters. Like, I think in, essentially you just make, need to make sure that you have a whitelist, that you enforce this whitelist, and then you're good. And, SVG should maybe not be part of this whitelist. <laughs> that helps. Any more questions? Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that would do as well. I'm surprised that Gmail doesn't do it, but that would do as well. I think the problem is that architecturally it's a bit hard because if you're working with a div that is editable and then reset the whole thing to become like an iframe sandbox, you have a lot of compatibility issues. You could think about working with source doc or whatnot. So it's hard, but it could be done and would be one of the safe and well proposable ways. So agreed. Yes, please. Nah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just didn't. Uh, but Feel free to do so. I'm, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure it's going to be exciting results. Yes, please. I'm planning to do something myself on uh, like becoming CMS, backhand CMS system. No, I'm just far too lazy for that. <laughs> Probably yes, yeah. But I'll leave this up to you. You're, you're the fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? There's one more question. I should have, but it didn't. Um, you see this as a recommendation, and in the cases where I tried it worked, but I didn't find out if there's like deviations from this behavior that you would get text only with Control Shift V. 
you know, instead of actual layers. So uh, maybe there's bypasses, but I don't know. I can't. I can't tell. <laughs> Might be another interesting field to have a look at. Alex, please. Uh, no. Those those attacks still do work. Um, not all of them, to be honest, but most of them still do work. Because I mean, I just highlighted that problem to them like some weeks ago, so it would be too early to expect to fix. But this iframe thing has been fixed at least partly. <laughs> Any more questions? Then, thank you very much. Um, as a quick announcement, uh, the next person to be standing here is not a speaker, but it's going to be Jürgen. He has an announcement for you. So please say hi to Jürgen. And, uh,